payments conference and state state branches all of them are here with us now and i extend to all of them very warm welcome welcome once again i thank you all and i pay my homage to lakshmi and meena thank you Shaji, you're on mute. Sha, please unmute. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Now we'll have uh, uh, Sheila Kakade's address. On behalf of All India Women's Conference, I, Sheila Kakade, extend namaskar to one and all who have joined in the webinar to commemorate the death anniversary of our dear patron Lakshmi N. Menon. I welcome Shri Shashi Tharoorji for readily accepting the invitation and giving insights uh, uh, into the similar positions as those Lakshmi ji had worked at United Nations. Kindly excuse me for my inability to join the meeting as I am traveling to Delhi and my flight is rescheduled to be at 5 p.m. from Mumbai. Actually, when Usha Nayarji told me of this program, I had readily agreed as we at AIWC head office <coughs> always have the gathering to pay tribute to Lakshmi ji on this day. And I thought this is the opportunity of joining with the home ground to pay respects to our beloved patron. Traveling 30 years down the memory lane, I recollect a frail figure clad in white khadi sari speaking at the AIWC conference in Trivandrum, where I saw her for the first time as I had joined the organization around that time. The impression of her words which came from the bottom of her heart, emphasizing on education for women of all age groups. Later, as I was associated with AIWC from Mumbai, didn't get any further chance to meet her. But the memory of that day is still alive in my heart. My salutes to her. I have heard a lot about her nature, her work, her dedicated services towards society mostly from our patron Shobhnatai Ranade. Lakshmiji's virtue, which influenced many, was non-attachment for anything. Any, any earthly thing never tempted her. She had no desire for anything and accepted anything that came her way, believing that it is a gift for, uh, from God to her. I wish all of us here develop this quality of non-attachment and accept whatever comes our way very happily. Hence, she had no second thought while mortgaging her own ornaments and property when she purchased land for AIWC in Delhi. She was president of All India Women's Conference from January 1955 to December 1957. She worked dedicatedly for the society through AIWC. Lakshmi Menon had a dream to reach out to village sisters through All India Committee for Eradication of Illiteracy Among Women. She was chairperson of Kasturba Gandhi National Memorial Trust from 1972 to 1985. The concept of Mother's Day celebrated at Aga Khan Palace, Pune is a gift by her. 
Lakshmi ji thought that Kasturba's memory should be commemorated as Mother's Day and should be observed not only in Kasturba Trust but also in every home of India. Her various positions in the political life also gave her very good opportunity to do selfless service. We at All India Women's Conference are grateful to God for having her as our president with such powerful vision for the society. On behalf of entire AIWC family, I express my heartfelt tribute to Lakshmi Ji Menon. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, for uh, sending that message. I see that she has just uh, logged in, uh, perhaps from the airport. Uh, I welcome you, Sheila. Uh, uh, Dr. Taru, now uh, we can go on to your uh, lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila Kakadeji, Ushaya Nayaji, Indira Pillaji, and other distinguished attendees. Greetings and salutations to you all. It's a pleasure to join the distinguished members of the Trivandrum branch of the All India Women's mm -hmm. Conference. Taru, taru. Are you not able to hear me? Yes. I, I'm hearing yes. other people. Yes, yes please. Mm -hmm. If others could please mute their microphones. Mm -hmm. Could others mute their microphones? Otherwise, it'll be very difficult to conduct uh, this brief talk, please. Uh, it's a pleasure, mm -hmm. as I was saying, to join you all and for the opportunity to pay tribute to the legacy of one of the organization's pioneering former presidents, former freedom fighter, and a trailblazing woman of early Indian politics, the late Lakshmi N. Menon. And I must say, she's somebody we're proud of, not just because of her remarkable career, but also because of her roots in our own Tiruvananthapuram. And I hope that from your MP, you will excuse a slightly parochial note of that remark, but given that it is the Tiruvananthapuram branch of the All India Women's Conference that has organized this event on the 26th anniversary of her passing at the age of 95 in 1994, I feel that we can, as uh, people who've had the honor of being part of this wonderful city and this wonderful area, pay tribute, especially to one of our own. Now in preparing my remarks for my address today, I was also acutely struck by the collective responsibility that all of us have in addressing a certain historical amnesia that most of us have developed about the pioneering role of women in, um, in, in constructing the entire edifice of the Indian Republic. The fact is that when we speak of modern India and the giants whose efforts we celebrate for their role in this remarkable project, not just the independence years, but the first decades after independence, the list we develop is too awful, too often about men, of men, by men, and for men. We speak of Gandhiji, of course, of Nehru, Ambedkar, Patel, Maulana, Azad, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, you can go through the list. Uh, but even the first woman in the cabinet, Dr. Avirajkumari Amrit Kaur, doesn't get mentioned that often and others whose contributions uh, have been memorialized in our history books and narratives uh, are rarely evoked amongst the women of that generation. And I must say that the, um, the, the great contributions of men are not to be disparaged, but the uh, extraordinary legacy of women uh, has in many ways, I think, not been put in proper perspective it's, it's sort of a byproduct of how we remember the history of our nation, that the pioneering women who stood side by side with their male counterparts in this journey are often forgotten or relegated to the footnotes. Not nearly enough has been said or acknowledged of the contributions of these women giants who not only played a critical role in fighting the uh, colonial machinations that kept our country oppressed, but did so at a time when they also had to confront the limitations imposed by a society that was very rigid in its perceptions of what a woman can and cannot be permitted to do. The irony is not lost that such deeply rooted stereotypes uh, have emerged from the global South, which at the same time has produced so many great memorable tall women leaders 
heads of government, heads of state, like Seema Bandaranaika, Arun Indira Gandhi, Benazir Bhutto, um, Chandrika Kumaratunga. There are so many cases, uh, Hasina, Sheikh Hasina, uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Khalid Azia. There are just so many women from South Asia who've occupied critical positions in government. And there were also women at the next level down, not heads of government and state, but leaders in international organizations and diplomacy, uh, playing important and unheralded uh, roles in diplomacy and in, and in ministries. All of these um, uh, typified, I would say, in the career of the late Lakshmi Menon. Today, we rightly celebrate Kamala Harris in the United States as a flag bearer of democracy. But while we do that, we should remember that these realities have already existed in India even before the dawn of independence. And in the early years, we had outstanding women leaders in positions of authority and influence. I do hope that more efforts will be made by the All India Women's Conference uh, through platforms such as this, even if they have to be virtual, to cure this historical amnesia in our society and to make amends for our ignorant acts of omission with regard to the role of these remarkable leaders. Now, all of you must be familiar uh, with the background and formative years of Lakshmi and Menon. Uh, she was born in Tiruvannathapuram in 1899 to Ramavarma Thampa and himself a famous reformer in the field of education. And her mother, Madhavi Kutiyamma, who passed away when Lakshmi Menon was just six years old. Still, she had a remarkable education, studied in Maharaja's College in Kerala, then Lady Willingdon Training College in Madras, and eventually went overseas to the Maria Gray College in London. And it was in London that she had the opportunity to meet Jawaharlal Nehru, courtesy of that doughty freedom fighter, her fellow Malayali Krishna Menon. Nehruji was deeply impressed and recognizing the potential of the woman before him, convinced her to join the Raja Sabha, which she did in the elections of 1952, the first Raja Sabha elections after the adoption of the constitution in 1950. And then she had a remarkable career in active politics where she was first, uh, she was amongst the very early women to be recognized with ministerial office. Uh, first, she was given the position of parliamentary secretary, which is still fallen into disuse, assisting Heruji, uh, who as prime minister was also the minister for external affairs. And then she was promoted because of her excellent performance as deputy minister. Again, a position that is very rarely used these days now it's become minister of state. And indeed, as uh, I think it was Indira Pillay who said this, I think I actually occupied the very office that Lakshmi Menon had occupied in South Block when I became minister of state for external affairs nearly five decades after she held that position. She therefore in that position as a minister, as a deputy minister, <coughs> was also selected to represent India at the UN General Assembly on a number of occasions. And I must say that when you look back at, at her, her remarkable uh, role, uh, she was also a wife. I mean, we mustn't uh, overlook that. She was uh, uh, the wife of Professor V.K. Nandan Menon, uh, who was a uh, vice chancellor of the University of Travancore just before Lakshmi Menon joined the Rajya Sabha and later of Patna University, as well as director of the Indian Institute of Public Administration. Uh, but she went on serving in the Rajya Sabha all the way till 1966. Um, and in her last years, from 62 to 66, she was Minister of State. So with a steady progress, Parliamentary Secretary, Deputy Minister, and finally Minister of State, before she said she'd had enough of politics and preferred to turn to social work. And um, I must say that, um, uh, as, as a politician who tries to write whenever I can, I'm very pleased that she uh, took advantage of her absence from politics uh, to write uh, a remarkable book on Indian women for the Oxford University Press's series of Oxford pamphlets on Indian affairs. And she also was a founder of the Federation of University Women in India. Um, it was her social service more than her political that led her to winning the Padma Bhushan in 1957, the second ever Malayali to receive the award. And of course, she was your president and patron 
of the All India Women's Conference for many years, uh, as well as the Vice President of the All India Prohibition Council, alongside Moraji Mar Desai, and, and, um, and she has been a significant voice in the combat against alcohol and drug abuse. Um, she was, for example, president of the Alcohol and Drug Information Center right until her death in 1994. Uh, and another cause that she took up, which again is in keeping with her father's record in education, her husband's record in education, as well as her own. So I would say in many ways, uh, a lifelong commitment. She was the president of the All India Committee for the Eradication of Illiteracy Amongst Women and chairman of the Kasturba Gandhi National Memorial Trust as well. I have to say that there is one more uh, slightly parochial uh, detail I need to mention here, which is that when she was Minister of State in the Nehru government, she played a very active role in overcoming a number of bureaucratic, governmental, and administrative hurdles involved in setting up the Tumba uh, rocket launching station in Tiruvananthapuram. So uh, the fact is that her own uh, extraordinary ability to work with people uh, and to find solutions to problems actually came through uh, brilliantly in that particular uh, in that particular effort. Now, I don't want this to just be a potted biography of Lakshmi Menon because when we are memorializing somebody, we need to understand um, the um, significance and the historical resonance of her life and achievements. And I want to tell you that if you look at her time at the United Nations, um, it was quite remarkable that um, uh, along with her illustrious female contemporaries, like Hansa Mehta, who is now also being rehabilitated a bit in the popular imagination, Begum Hamid Ali, and of course, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, the best known of the lot, sister of Jawaharlal Nehru and president of the UN General Assembly. Lakshmi Menon's role in the United Nations has been recognized and celebrated for her pivotal role in advocating the cause of gender equality during the formative years of the United Nations. Scholars and experts studying India's contribution to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights point out that these Indian women, and, and these four in particular, the four I've just named, played the most crucial role in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Not just, by the way, in the name of women's rights alone, but for the by, by ensuring the preservation of secular language and approaches to human rights, and at the same time stressing the indivisibility of human rights and the entire idea of non-discrimination as well as the right to work. I'll give you one example, of course, in, um, in terms of the business of gender neutral language. The draft of the original charter, the original Universal Declaration of Human Rights, had somewhat old fashioned or what I might today call patriarchal or paternalistic language, such as all men are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Um, they are endowed by nature with reason and conscience and should act towards one another like brothers. So all men and brothers, the assumption was again, very uh, paternalistic and, and, and anything but I would say, um, uh, uh, equality uh, was, was failed to be reflected in the language. Um, so I want, I'm sorry, I'm again hearing conversations coming into my ears. Please switch off your mic. So coming back to you uh, on the subject, uh, that draft uh, was rightly objected to by Lakshmi and Menon. And she said she was the Indian representative to the third committee of the United Nations General Assembly that was trying to adopt this draft. And she said, um, you have to modify this language. How can you exclude women in this way? And it was her efforts that led to the final text of Article 1 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which said all human beings, it now says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Even brotherhood was a concession to the men there, but not like brothers, which would have been totally sexist language. So she had an opportunity to speak about her approach during the drafting 
of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And Lakshmi Menon said at that time, and I quote, the full significance of the Indian delegation's attitude in the third committee could only be understood when considered in relation to the decision taken by the Indian Constituent Assembly to include in the constitution of our country the same rights and freedoms as were proclaimed in the declaration. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was born from the need to reaffirm those rights after their violation during the war. It was now more than ever necessary to reaffirm those rights. The remedies to be applied to humanity had to be adapted to the seriousness of the conditions in which it lived. And when conditions deteriorated, the remedy had to be all the stronger and more drastic. And so Lakshmi Menon continued, that was one of the reasons why the present declaration was fuller and more detailed than all the other similar declarations. Earlier declarations had not mentioned rights, such as the right to equal pay for equal, the right of mothers and children to social protection, whether the children were born in or out of wedlock, the right to education, equality of rights for men and women. Those rights, said Lakshmi Menon, were the expression of a new social order of true democracy based on social justice. So it's very important to recall Lakshmi Menon's own words because this is how she had in fact uh, spoken of her own contribution in this area. And I want to say that several decades later, just a couple of years ago in 2018, our last permanent representative of the United Nations, last but one now, Syed Akbaruddin, my good friend, rightly recognized Lakshmi Menon's role and pointed out that Lakshmi Menon, along with her colleagues from other developing countries, strongly opposed the concept of colonial relativism. I'm sorry, I have a lot of competition from your members, it seems. Strongly opposed the concept of colonial relativism, which sought to deny human rights to people in countries under colonial rule. While the global north, said Akbaruddin, tries to position itself as a leader of gender equality, there have only been three women who have served as the president of the United Nations General Assembly, and all three have been from the global south. And he's right. The first was Vijay Lakshmi Pandit in 1953, followed by Angie Elizabeth Brooks of Liberia in 1969, and then my own friend, Haya Rashid Al Khalifa of Bahrain in 2006. So the larger point is that the concepts of gender equality continue to be seen by too many people as a Western import. But the fact remains that it has only become a widely accepted principle within society thanks to the manner in which documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written and worded, which only happened thanks to the foresight and awareness of leaders like Lakshmi Menon. Today, as we remember her illustrious life on the 25th, I beg your pardon, the, the, the 26th anniversary of her passing, we must look back on this life, not just in admiration, but in our determination to learn from her and to implement the principles and values for which she so courageously stood, even when many thought she was ahead of her time. Thank you all very much to all the members of the All India Women's Conference for giving me such a patient hearing. I'm very grateful to be with you and congratulations to the Tiruvananthapuram chapter for your wonderful work in this regard. Good luck in keeping the flame alive. Jai Thank you, sir, for that brilliant reminder of our uh, shining legacy. Because uh, Lakshmi and Menon belongs not just to AWC, not just to Trivandrum. She is for the uh, whole nation, and uh, we are rightly proud of her. Uh, I wonder if you have time for a couple of questions, sir. I'll do my very best. I am actually, I have one minute left before my next engagement. So one question perhaps, go no, ahead. Uh, no, and at grabbing my uh, privilege as a presenter, I would uh, just mention one thing. You mentioned uh, historical amnesia. At AWC, we are already taking steps for correcting that, we hope. Just 10 days back, we had a webinar to remember Annie Muscreen. 
yes. from your own constituency and the first woman to be elected to parliament from uh, Kerala and uh, the member of the constituent assembly. But in spite of all her uh, uh, huge contributions, uh, hardly anybody in Kerala, not even in Trivandrum, know about her work or about her life. So one recommendation that came up in the webinar was that we should take steps to request the government to include her life and her work and especially her presentation speech in the constituent assembly in the syllabus for schools and colleges. So we'll very soon be approaching SCRT in Kerala and NCRT at the national level for uh, achieving this. And we request you to please help us in doing this. We'll be approaching you very soon. I'll be delighted to do that. Thank you very much, Ushaji. We all go Thank past you. her statue in Tiruvannathapuram yes. in the eponymous uh, Animus Green Square, which is actually not a square, but a circle. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, uh, she, uh, uh, people need to know much more about. I have read the speech you are referring to, uh, a very, very proud representative of Tiruvannathapuram and indeed of all of South India in the Constituent Assembly. And this illustrious figure uh, should be given her due. So by all means, be in touch with me separately. I'll be happy to join you in, uh, in fighting for her, the recognition of her work. And uh, I might add, we need to push the others. Uh, Lakshmi Menon, as, as you said, let's look beyond Tiruvannathapuram, Hansa Mehta, Begum Hamid Ali. All of them deserve to be far better known for their pioneering contributions. And I think we should all participate uh, collectively with the All India Women's Conference nationwide to uh, adopt this as a priority for the coming years. Thank you, sir. Now, Mrs. Manju Kak would like to address a question to you. Manju? Oh, I, think, I think the Honorable uh, Member of Parliament is in a hurry. So I would- I'll give you a uh, brief reply, Manjuji. Go ahead. Well, my uh, question was really, I was reading your latest book and uh, about being, and I was wondering whether you had any thought that India is the unique country where women got the right to vote along with independence? And is there some special ingredient that you could recognize as the reason for it? Well, I, I, I do pay tribute to our founding fathers and mothers because I must say there was never any debate uh, about this issue. Uh, there was, as you know, a debate about the universal franchise in the Constituent Assembly. Some people were still anxious to do, to follow the British practice and remain uh, wedded to either a vote based on education or a vote based on property ownership. But uh, our founding fathers and mothers were absolutely uncompromising in saying that no, in, in our country, we will be a democracy for everybody and everybody will get the vote. But what is interesting is there was no debate on whether women should get the vote or not. I think they accepted that. I think one of the things that I've always felt about the paradox of India's societal attitudes to women is that we simultaneously um, uh, show in our daily lives an enormous amount of respect to women, uh, especially those we either maternalize or deify. Uh, either great respect to our mothers and, and elder women, or we show great uh, veneration for the goddess figures in our culture. But at the same time, we treat uh, women whom we should be seeing as equals, we treat them very badly. Our wives uh, uh, are, are frankly uh, treated with bluntly disrespect in the majority of Indian households, and daughters are patronized in a very patriarchal way. And, and there is a great paradox in that, but because we've had this culture also of reverence and love and adoration, um, uh, at least for some categories of women, perhaps we were more prepared to accept the idea of women as authority figures and to listen to them. That's the simplest possible explanation, but there is undoubtedly a contradiction. I will not claim any special credit to India for being enlightened because we see too many examples of lack of enlightenment in social lives across the country. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we, we see it, for example, in unequal levels of literacy outside Kerala, where women were uh, from 18, 19 onwards were educated on a par with men. So there was very little difference in literacy rates between women and men in Kerala. Uh, but everywhere else in India, women, even today, are below men in terms of literacy rates. Uh, uh, all of these things suggest an unequality, an inequality of treatment, which, um, suggests that we have still a lot to learn. But on the vote, there was never any debate. We have accepted 
uh, uh, women's equality from the very start. Let me say that the book you're referring to, The Battle of Belonging, actually mentions briefly this issue, but goes beyond that into a larger discussion of the nature of our nationalism. Who are we as the Indian people? What kind of nationhood did the constitution of India enshrine? And as Lakshmi Menon told us, uh, it was, it was uh, very much reflective of the human rights principles in the Universal Declaration, including women's equality that the Indian women had to fight for in language as well as content. And that was very much there in our constitution. And the book, of course, also talks about the importance of civic nationalism, of institutions, of liberal constitutionalism as the underpinning of our democracy. Thank you for reading it, and I hope others will do the same. And let me once again thank the All India Women's Conference, Thiruvanthapuram chapter, for having invited me. And let me wish you all uh, a successful rest of your meeting while I move on to my next one. Thank you, thank sir. you very much. Thank you. Thanks, thank sir. you. We are grateful to you, sir. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and spending five minutes extra with us. And uh, we hope to see you with us again soon when we have an appropriate uh, function or webinar. We'll definitely be coming to you again. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, and Jai Hind. Jai Hind. So now we move on to the next item on our agenda. Uh, uh, Mr. Director, of course, as was mentioned in the welcome. Uh, um, uh, speech. Uh, he has joined us and we are very, very happy to welcome him in our midst. He is uh, director of the Institute of Alcohol Studies in London and uh, uh, he delivered the first Lakshmi Menon commemorative le lecture in Trivandrum under the uh, auspices of Addict India in uh, 1995. And uh, actually, he saw the notification about this meeting on Facebook, and uh, uh, he expressed his desire to attend. And we are extremely happy to welcome you here, sir. Uh, would you like to say a few words about Lakshmi Menon and about your association with her? Please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. We can. You can hear me? Yeah, please go on. Right. My greetings to all women of India. It's a great pleasure for me and a great honour to have discovered that you have this memorial lecture, commemorative lecture for Leshki Manan today in Trivandrum. My interest in India was born when I was eight years old. I remember seeing pictures of a strange man in a loincloth who was in all our paper, newspapers at that time. And I asked my mother, who was a miner's wife, a coal miner's wife, who's this strange man? And my mother quickly replied to me, he is a good and great man. And that was Gandhi. And that's how Gandhi was thought of amongst the working class of the United Kingdom at that time. And so it was a great honor for me when I came to India 50 years later. It took me all that time to come to India, but I remember uh, starting off my journey in Mumbai and then going to Delhi, but it was in Chennai when I met Ilashki Menon for the first time in 1990. And what a great lady and honorable lady she was. We were fascinated, my wife and I, that we were met at the airport the following day we had been in Chennai and she chaired a meeting there that I was speaking at uh, that here was this elderly 90 year old lady from India very sprite when we were still very tired in the morning in Chennai airport at seven o'clock in the morning and later that day when we got to Trivandrum she was chairing the meeting that I was speaking at she was a wonderful lady and it was wonderful for me to have met one of your great freedom fighters. And it's a pity today that the modern generation of young people in India don't, and same in this country, don't recognize all these early freedom fighters that gave us so much and why we are here today in freedom. And then 
returned to India in 1995 to Trivandrum to give the first memorial lecture. And I'm reminded that two and a half thousand years ago, the Buddha sitting under his tree of enlightenment saw the great problem of alcohol in India at that time. It was a problem which Gandhi recognized and a problem very much at the heart of Mrs. Menon. You are India, the home of the temperance movement. And coming back from India, I was reminded of a quote of Gandhi when he said, if drink in spite of its harmfulness was not fashionable among Englishmen, we would not find it in the organized state we do. But if Gandhi were to come back today, almost 70 over 70 years after you were given your freedom and your independence, he would still see in India today a drink problem. A problem which is as severe as it was during the days of Buddha and in the days of Gandhi. But we've come a long way in the last decades. The World Health Organization in 2010 recognized that the problem of alcohol was global and it produced its global alcohol strategy. And having heard what uh, Mrs. Menon did with the United Nations, she would have been delighted knowing her interest in the alcohol problem that in 2011, the United Nations had a meeting on the harmful use of alcohol uh, due to the non-communicable diseases. At that meeting, in the uh, communication from that meeting, the WHO, <clears throat> sorry, the, well, the United Nations recognized that alcohol was one of four key risk factors in the development of non-communicable diseases. We have to recognize that alcohol is not just simply a problem in India, it's an immense global problem. But the effective strategies were put forward by the World Health Organization in 2010 have been harmed by the drink industry. The drink industry is still a very powerful universal force and still a very powerful force in India today. And so in 2020, the World Health Organization is having a review of its strategy and is wishing to produce a new strategy for the 2020s. And we would hope that India women will play a part, will let your voice be heard in that strategy. Women, as we've heard from the previous lecture, have had an enormous role in the United States. For example, it was the women that created a strong temperance movement to provide in the early days of prohibition in the United States. It was a strong force in the United Kingdom in the 19th century. And it will be the voice of women in India and the voice of women in the world that will help to see the reduction in the harmful use of alcohol. I hope that you will participate and play your part as you have done in the past in order to make the place, the world, a safer place without the harmful use of alcohol. I greet you today. I pay honor to Mrs. Menon and to you and all of you in your work today. Thank you, sir. Now I request Mr. Johnson Idayaran Mulam, who is a uh, he, they have partnered with AWC in hosting this event. I uh, request him to tell us something about his work. He worked very closely with uh, Mrs. Menon in the final years of her life on a cause that is uh, extremely dear to her. And uh, I request uh, Mr. Johnson to please tell us about his association with uh, Mrs. Menon and about the work of Addict India. Good evening, everybody. It's a great uh, memorable event today, remembering Lashmi and Man on, on her 26th death anniversary. My memories are going back to 1973 
when I first met her while as a college student. Our relationship started from that day. Lishmi and Menon has influenced me a lot. She changed my perception to be a social worker for a lifetime. And we worked together right from 1975, particularly in the area of temperance and prohibition. At that time, she was the president of the Kerala Madhyavarjana Prasthanam. That was the first moment in Kerala. And she nominated me as the youth convener in 1975, where we formed the Youth Council for Prohibition. I remember in 1977, when Maharaji Deshai was the Prime Minister of India, when he declared that within four years, he wanted to implement total prohibition in the country. There was a big gathering in Delhi under the auspices of the All India Prohibition Council where thousands of people from all over the country gathered at Dutchkut. Prime Minister Maharaji Deshai himself inaugurated the meeting and Dr. Shushila Nair, the, the former health minister was at that time the president of the Kerala Prohibition, sorry, the All India Prohibition Council. And later I know she was also part of the All India Women's Conference. Deshmi and Menon at that time was one of the vice presidents along with Maharaji Deshai. So it, the movement started in a big way from 1977. And in 78, the Kerala Prohibition Council was officially formed. And Deshmi and Menon became the first president of the Kerala Prohibition Council. So we had a lot of work together and we worked together for, from morning to evening going to villages, going to towns, meeting people, and trying to do our best for the cause of the temperance movement. But finally, we realized just by closing down liquor shop is not the answer. We thought there should be an holistic approach. We had several rounds of discussion, and that discussion finally prevailed the way for the formation of Alcohol and Drug Information Center, Edic India in 1988 with Lishmi and Menon as the founder president and myself as the secretary. So during the last days till 1994, till her last breath, she was very part of the prohibition movement in Kerala, especially under the leadership of Edic India. We started a lot of projects in the country lot of innovative projects. The first prison intervention program in the country was started in Sabjil at Takulangara, which was later replicated in different prisons, including Tihar jail in 1994. There were schools project, college project, community project, project at uh, juvenile home, project at uh, mental health center, and different types of programs from institution to the grassroots level. Reshmi and Menon was the guiding force and we could not forget her for what she has contributed. But the most important thing which I always respect us is her simplicity in her life. I never have seen a simple person like her. How she treat others, how she care for others and how she take care of the downtrodden and also the people around her. I know her contribution in the field of literacy and the empowerment of women. I've seen many of the leaders, especially all the present leaders of a country, many of the leaders I met only through of my respected, my beloved Amma Lishmi and Menon. In 1994, on this very same day, early three, uh, at three o'clock, at 3.42 AM, she breathed her last. And her funeral also took place on the same evening. I remember how thousands of people gathered within short notice when the TV channels were not there at that time. What a respect she got from the community, from the people. She was a person who loved everyone. She worked for the cause of 
എജ്യൂക്കേഷൻ എൻവയറൺമെൻറ്റ് പ്രൊയിബിഷൻ എംപവർമെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് വുമൻ ലിറ്ററസി ആൻഡ് ഓൺ ആൻഡ് ഷീ ബി റിമെമ്പേർഡ് ഫോർ എവർ എസ് വി പീപ്പിൾ ഹു ഹവ് വർക്ക് വിത്ത് ഹെർ ഹു ഹവ് എൻജോയ്ഡ് ഹെർ ലവ് ആൻഡ് കെയർ ആൻഡ് അഫെക്ഷൻ ഇസ് സ്റ്റിൽ ഹിയർ ഐ വെരി ഹാപ്പി ഐ മോസ്റ്റ് ഹാപ്പി ബിക്കോസ് ഡയറക്ടർ ദ ഫോർ the director of the fort is here today among us he was a pioneer of our movement he has supported us like anything he was part of the global policy alliance at that time and he came to india in 1995 he was the director of the institute of alcohol studies too that's what everybody was quoting us institute of alcohol studies london but he was more than that he was part of the who global alcohol policy and the un policy has contributed a lot for this cause and he and mrs marion has a close relationship with rashmi and nana which he already mentioned and i'm very happy that the first memorial lecture was delivered by rashmi uh, by brother uh, director of the fort at musket hotel to antrim on the same day in 1995 and after 25 years i'm very happy that brother director of the fort is here today to share his thoughts on rishmi and meron i must thank the all india women's conference for organizing this event uh, the second time we were partnering together we are very happy that the memories of rishmi and meron and the cause she stood for should live and we look forward for many occasions where we could see that the dreams of rishmi and meron realize in the best proper way thank you thanks a lot pranams and my tribute to the memory of lakshmi and manon of my dear amma thank you mr johnson and now if anybody would like to uh, add to what we have already heard i invite you to unmute yourself and uh, speak then i think uh, uh, we can uh, wind up the meeting now uh, mrs lakshmi menon always insisted that a function must start with vande mataram and end with uh, the national anthem so following her uh, wish we are also doing the same thing now we will uh, 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 i'll very briefly give word of thanks to all of you all the uh, official Hello. Pusha, I would like to say something. Yeah, Kuljit, please. My namaskar to everyone. Today, I am really emotionally touched by all the three speakers, Mr. Tharoor also, Mr. Derek also, and in the end also. They have given lovely speeches and they have made us aware of our history. The type of people, the type of leaders we had. and how it is said that she lakshmi menon was the simplest person she he had ever seen and she was always good to others my heart is touched to be the members of fawc where are we today are we following the footsteps of her uh, elders are we following the footsteps of her leaders these days are not just to celebrate in their memory and say two three speeches we must get inspired by their lifestyle of living we must get motivated and inspired and try to follow whatever goals they had set for us the purpose for this function is not to just for half an hour for one hour listen to the speeches but to understand and try to follow their footsteps i am really touched today i am telling you i have i am very emotional usha i can't say more than this and i think we should try to learn lessons from such celebrations from such functions from such seminars these are my words maybe this uh, today's function will bring little change in all of us which is worth and maybe rwc will definitely have a better future from where we have come to where all of us should introspect and try to think over that how our leaders our ancestors our patrons our president they paved a wonderful path for us and we should follow that path which they asked us to lead thank you so much usha i don't want to say and i think i can't say more than this 
I'm becoming so emotional and there are tears in my eyes. Thank you so much for arranging this wonderful program today and for the wonderful speakers also. Thanks a lot, Kulji. Thank you, Kulji. Uh, she was Shai. Secretary General of All, in, uh, All India Women's Conference. Uh, now I think... Usha? Admini... Usha? Uh, yeah. Usha, I'm uh, Yes, please start. Uh, I just want to say a few words. Because I met Mrs. Menon long back when she interviewed me for a UWS scholarship to go to UK. At that time, uh, uh, she was in the board. And of course, uh, I, my application was forwarded and all that, but I didn't get selection. Final selection, I didn't get. And we all call her Amma, affectionately call her Amma. And uh, I definitely, I used to meet her for so many meetings in Trivandrum and also for the UWA meetings outside, outside Trivandrum. And one thing I noticed in her behavior is that she never pays, uh, gives any importance for the people. Uh, even, even though we are from her own state, she never thinks that gives any special attention or anything. Everybody is same for her. No special uh, uh, attention or anything for the people from Kerala or anything like that. All are, all are equal and important for her. So this I just want to mention. I have a lot of memories to say, but due to lack of time, I will keep it for another occasion. Thank you, Usha. Thank you, Padmini Ji. Uh, anybody else uh, would uh, like to contribute? Then I'll... Uh... Just uh, wind up the meeting now after expressing my deep uh, gratitude to each one of you for uh, having attended this function and especially to Mr. Uh, Derek Rutherford and his wife, I think, is also present here. Uh, we are grateful to them for uh, joining us just because they got a notification of the event. Uh, we'll keep you in our contacts now and definitely when we have uh, functions like this, we will uh, let you know. And uh, I thank uh, Johnson for uh, all the help that he has been giving us in uh, arranging this function. Last year also, it was largely due to his effort that we could have a big meeting in Trivandrum. Uh, I thank uh, Suvarna, which is a code code branch of AWC uh, and uh, the member Lakshmi Nandakumar, who gave the uh, prayer and uh, such a beautiful uh, rendering of Vande Mataram. And before I uh, uh, go for the national anthem, I would like to thank uh, our own branch, Samyukta, and uh, uh, it's uh, the uh, little girl Nandana who's going to uh, render the national anthem for us now. I hope that all of you will uh, uh, join with her in. Uh, giving the national anthem. And I thank the president and members of Trivandrum branch and all Kerala branches. And uh, our uh, president, Sheila Kakde, she had also joined us for a brief while, Secretary General Kurchit Kaur, uh, treasurer. Um, uh, 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 treasurer and uh, uh, zonal organizers, vice presidents, joint secretaries, so many functionaries have joined us and especially patrons, Bina Jainji, Bina Koliji. I thank all of you for joining us and uh, actually we had full house. We had 100 people and I can see that more are watching on uh, YouTube. Uh, so we are very happy to have hosted this function. Uh, so let us uh, wind up with the national anthem now. Jai Bharat Just a minute, I'll uh... Radha Janagana Mangala Daya Gajaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He 
I'm sorry there was some problem in that, uh, but uh, that little girl rendered it so well. Uh, now I'll uh, stop.